everyone has a story and everyone has faced challenges and overcome them and, and I think you always have such a different perspective of people when you learn those things. I was born in Taiwan and I came here when I was three. It, I mean, it's really a story of a family that literally gave up everything in their home country and came into the United States as immigrants and not speaking any English at all and just like both working two jobs and have and a family of four. Eventually coming up with enough money to start our own business. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I ended up going to law school because I didn't want to be a doctor. That, those are kind of my only choices growing up. I can honestly say I, I really like wake up excited to come to work every day. Uh, I think this is really the, where I'm supposed to be. When I came out of law school, I had no idea what I was doing. I was, it was you know, I could barely tie my shoes and put on a tie, uh, much less decide what to do with a young girl who was being sexually trafficked, who was homeless, who had a mother who was drug addicted. The challenges that, and issues that we see in this building are so complex. I mean, they touch on the education system, the foster care system, DSHS. Uh, issues of homelessness, parenting, all this stuff, and just to have someone you know, come right off the street to make good decisions for our community on those kinds of cases struck me as, as not being the best, um, um, best way to go about it. And by creating our own juvenile division, it's, it's allowed us to recruit attorneys that want to do this work and people with a lot more experience that, and also see themselves as having a career as a prosecutor specifically in the juvenile division. A prosecutor is making a recommendation on what to do with a kid. I mean, that can change the trajectory of their life forever. You can go into any of these offices and talk to one of our prosecutors and say, hey, tell me about this so-and-so, this one kid that is in the system. And many of them will be able to say, well, you know, this is where he lives. This is where he's going to school. These are his brothers and sisters. These are the challenges that he's facing. These are the struggles that are in his life. And just having that intimate knowledge of uh, a young person's challenges, I think, puts us in such a better position to help steer this person in the right direction. There is really nothing more expensive than locking people up. And research will show that there's probably nothing almost less effective. And I, I want to change the narrative. I'm, I'm done talking about being tough on crime or being soft on crime. I'd rather be smart about it. And that's not to say like, yeah, we have young people who are committing or engaging in behaviors right now that are so dangerous to the community and to themselves that yes, we do need a detention facility. But I think for the vast majority of the kids who touch the juvenile justice system, not every response has to be a criminal response. I think, I think what I've seen that works is that accountability can take a lot of different forms. You know, restorative justice is very simple. It's about like the idea that you cause some harm. How are you going to fix that? How are you going to make things right? One of our, my favorite programs is our Choose 180 program. And so that's for young people who uh, commit fairly low-level offenses like shoplifting or property damage. We're partnering with the community. So instead of coming to court, they show up for a workshop on a Saturday afternoon for four hours. The message that the community is telling them is, hey, you did something wrong, but that doesn't define who you are. You are still part of our community and we're, we love you, we care about you, and we want to help you make better decisions moving forward. I think there are a lot of people around the country doing really amazing things around criminal justice reform and, and we're happy to be a part of that movement.